Christ. Apart from the questions raised at the end of the last lecture, there would be much to add to our present theme, but it is impossible in ten lectures to exhaust a consideration of the universe. Therefore allow me, before I deal with our main question, to make some remarks that in a certain sense will relate to our concluding observations. The first observation that I have to make is difficult, indeed hardly understandable at all, for modern consciousness. For it is good if one is aware, but it is good if one is aware of it. It relates to the question of how planetary structures, once they have appeared, disappear again. From a spiritual point of view, it is clear how the course of development occurs. Beings ascend to higher stages, and as they advance, they have to leave their previous places of activity. That is, they must leave their former dwelling places that enabled them, for a period, to develop certain faculties they would not otherwise have been able to acquire. When, in the course of evolution, that time we call the old Lemurian period drew near, humanity had come so far in its development that it had recapitulated all that could be achieved through the stages of Saturn, Sun, and Moon. Then humanity appeared in the environment of earthly evolution, which had just been made ready for our further development. We developed through Lemurian and Atlantean times on into our own period, and moving from incarnation to incarnation we will develop further in the future. Then after a time humanity will have to leave the earth again. The earth will have nothing further to give humanity for it will not be able to offer further possibilities of development. You could imagine that after the departure of humanity our earth would become a desolate ruin. You could compare it with a city that had been deserted by its inhabitants. You know what such a city looks like after only a short time, how it gradually turns into a mound of earth. Seeing ancient cities taken over by the forces of nature gives us a graphic picture of the process. So it is today in reality. But this will not be true for the future of the earth. The following observation can guide you toward an understanding to the following questions. How will it be in the future of our earth? What is the significance for the development of the earth of such persons as Leonardo da Vinci, Raphael, or any of the other great geniuses in this or that field? What does it mean for earthly development that Raphael or Michelangelo produced wonderful works of art that are still enjoyed by thousands and thousands of people to this very day? Some of you may have felt a certain sadness on seeing Leonardo's Last Supper in Milan, and you may have wondered how much longer this magnificent work will last. We should remember that Goethe on his first Italian journey still beheld the work in its full glory that we can no longer see it in that state. From Goethe's time until today, the fate of this work of art, within its outward material environment, is such that it now calls forth feelings of sadness in us. And for people who will live as long after us as we live after Goethe, the work will no longer be in existence. So it is with everything that human beings have created and embodied in physical matter on earth. The same is also true for the earth itself, and even for the creation of human thoughts. Imagine that period of time when human beings will ascend, spiritualized, into higher spheres. Thoughts in the present sense of the word, I am not at all referring to scientific thoughts, for in three or four hundred years they will no longer have any significance, but human thoughts, as produced by the brain and meaningful on earth, have no significance for higher worlds. They are only significant on earth. But humanity will have left the earth. What will happen then to everything that we have created on earth in the course of centuries and millennia? What must first of all be considered from a spiritual perspective is the evolution of the individual. Leonardo da Vinci has risen higher by means of what he accomplished. That constitutes his ascent. We ask ourselves, are the great thoughts the great impulses that the great creators imprinted on the substance of the earth of any significance for the future of the earth? Will the future, 
reduce the earth to dust, and will everything that men and women have made out of the earth disappear when the planet no longer exists? You admire Cologne Cathedral. Certainly, in a relatively short time, not one stone will rest upon another. Does this mean it is of no significance for the earth as a whole, that human beings embody the idea of the Cologne Cathedral in stone? We are not now considering what a human being takes with him from the earth. We are looking at the earth itself. A planet actually becomes smaller and smaller in the course of its development. It contracts. That is the destiny of the material part of a planet. But that is not the whole story. It is, so to speak, only the part that can be observed by means of physical eyes and instruments. There is also an evolution of matter that proceeds beyond what can be so observed. I now want to consider the evolution of matter beyond this point, and thereby I come to what I previously described as difficult, indeed almost incomprehensible, to contemporary understanding. The earth is constantly contracting. Matter is being pressed from all sides into the center. Now, I can say, and naturally with full awareness, that there is a law of the conservation of force. But I must also say in full awareness that there is another fact known to every occultist, that matter presses increasingly into the center and remarkably disappears into the middle point. Imagine a piece of matter pressed more and more into the central point where it disappears. It is not being pushed through to the other side. At the center it actually disappears into nothingness. In other words, eventually the earth, as its material aspect presses in upon the middle point, will disappear into the center. But that is not all. As much as disappears at the center, so much reappears at the periphery. It reappears at the extremity. Matter disappears at one point in space, the center, and reappears at another, the circumference. Everything that disappears into the center emerges again at the periphery. Everything has been worked into this matter. The beings who were at work on the planets impressed everything into the, into the matter. Naturally, the matter is not in its present form, but in a form that it received by means of this process of transformation. So you will see Cologne Cathedral, whose material particles disappeared into the middle point, reappearing from the other side. Nothing, absolutely nothing is lost of what has been accomplished on a planet. It comes back from the other side. All that came to us during the earliest phase of earthly development before Saturn was thus transferred outside, beyond the zodiac. In primeval wisdom this is called the crystal heaven. It is where the deeds of beings belonging to a previous evolution were deposited. They formed the basis on which new beings could become creative. As I said before, it is difficult to understand these things with contemporary understanding because we are accustomed to considering only the material aspect. We are not used to acknowledging that matter can disappear from one position in three-dimensional space and come back again somewhere else after it has gone through another dimension. As long as you remain in your thinking in the context of three-dimensional space, you cannot grasp it, for this phenomenon goes beyond three-dimensional space. Thus it cannot be seen until it again re-enters three-dimensional space from the other side. In the intervening period, it is in another dimension. This is something that we must understand, for aspects of cosmic creation are bound together in the most complex manner. Something in one place is connected in a complicated way to something else found in an entirely different place in three-dimensional space. The formation of our planets began with ancient Saturn, that is, how it really began. Then the formation continued until Jupiter. As the whole creation began on Jupiter, as you know, all of the beings of the periphery also participated in the process. But just as beings within worked to set out the planetary system and continue their own development, so, too. The outlying beings worked inward from the periphery. 
as certain beings from the center withdrew outward, those beings who were out in cosmic space did the same. Certain ones on the periphery also withdrew. As Jupiter itself contracted, beings who had withdrawn compressed to form Uranus. Similarly, during the development of Mars, beings who had withdrawn contracted to form Neptune. The names Uranus and Neptune are, of course, no longer chosen in the same way that the ancients chose appropriate names for these things, although there still remains something significant in the name Uranus. It was given at a time when one still had an inkling of the process of giving the right name. Therefore everything lying beyond our own planetary system was designated collectively with the name Uranus. Thus we see that both planets, which our modern astronomy places on a par with the other planets, actually stand on quite a different basis, and in fact have nothing especially to do with the formation of our world. They represent worlds that came about because beings who still had something to do with us during the ancient Saturn period withdrew and established their dwelling place beyond the periphery of the universe. Many facts can be deduced from this. For example, that these planets have retrograding moons and so on. We have now surveyed in rough outline the process through which our solar system came into being, and we have raised the question, what position does the human being have in relation to the beings of the higher hierarchies, who are actually our human ancestors? We can begin with the most exalted, the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. Indeed, in characterizing their nature, we can arrive at a good idea of the human being. But once we go beyond the seraphim, we enter into the region of the Holy Trinity. That is what the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones have that is extraordinary, beyond what other beings in the universe have. They enjoy what is called, quote, the immediate gaze of the Godhead, unquote. They are endowed from the beginning with what human beings must gradually seek over the course of their development. As human beings, we say, to attain higher and higher powers of cognition, will, and so on, we must begin where we are today. If we do this, we shall draw nearer and nearer to the Godhead who will be increasingly present with us. Thus we must develop ourselves toward what is still veiled from us. We must draw toward divinity. Such is the difference between the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones on the one hand and humanity on the other. From the beginning of their development, these highest beings of the spiritual hierarchies were immediately present with the Godhead, the Divine Trinity. From the very beginning they enjoyed being within sight of the Divinity. For the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones, <clears throat> the condition that human beings ought to progress toward existed from the very beginning. It is extremely important to recognize that from the time of their origin, these beings beheld God, and that as long as they live they will always behold God. They accomplish everything through gazing upon God, and God works through them. They could not do otherwise than to act as they do. It would be impossible for them to do otherwise. The sight of God is such a powerful force, has such an influence upon them that they accomplish what the Godhead ordains with unerring certainty and immediate impulse. Nothing resembling deliberation or judgment exists in the sphere of these beings. There is only the beholding of the Godhead's commands in order to receive the immediate impulse to do what they have beheld. They see the Godhead in its original true form, as it really is. They consider themselves simply as those who fulfill the will and wisdom of the divine. Such is the situation of the highest hierarchy. Descending to the next hierarchy, to the beings called dominions, mights, and powers, or spirits of wisdom, movement, and form, we must say that they no longer have the immediate gaze of the Godhead. They no longer see God in his immediate form, as he is, but they see God's manifestation, as God reveals himself, if I may put it so, through his countenance. So it is clear to them that the countenance is the Godhead. Like the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones, they also receive a direct impulse to carry out the manifestations of the Godhead. The impulse is not quite as powerful, but it is, nevertheless, 
still direct. It would be impossible for the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones to say that they would not do what they discern as ordained by the Godhead. It would be unthinkable because of their proximity to the Godhead. But it would be equally out of the question for the dominions, mights, and powers to do what was not willed by the Godhead itself. For the evolution of the world to advance, however, something very extraordinary had to intervene. We are now introducing a subject that, it al- that has always been difficult to understand, even for those who have advanced to a certain degree of mystery wisdom. In the ancient mysteries, one sought to make it comprehensible in the following way. At a particular stage of initiation into the ancient mysteries, the neophyte was led into the presence of hostile powers who had a cruel and horrible appearance and who performed the most dreadful acts before the eyes of the neophyte. Those who did these things were none other than masked priests, masked sages. To bring about the necessary temptations, priests disguised themselves in ghastly demonic forms as dreadful beings performing the most terrible acts that one could possibly imagine. Why was this done? Why did the initiate, the priest, bring before the neophyte the guise of the wrongdoer, the mask of evil? To show the neophyte how far development could err from the right path, actually let me read that again, it wasn't a question, to show the neophyte how far development could err from the right path, the neophyte was supposed to have the illusion of standing face to face with evil. Only when the unmasking occurred did the neophyte see the truth. The illusion was removed. Only then did the neophyte know that this scene was a means of creating a trial or test. To strengthen and arm the neophyte against it, evil was presented in its most hideous forms by priests who, of course, did not err. This was merely a reflection of something that actually took place in cosmic evolution. During the period between the Jupiter and Mars stages of development, if I may express it somewhat trivially, a host of beings from the sphere of the dunamis or mites were countermanded. Instead of acting as progressive influences, they were placed in the course of development to cause obstacles. We have come to know this as the war in heaven. The actions of these adversely commanded mites to coin a phrase, were thrown across the path of development for the ruling cosmic powers of the hierarchy said to themselves that if the path were smooth, what was intended to come into existence could never arise. Something greater must arise. Now suppose that you wish to push a cart, and because you push it forward, your powers of strength develop to a certain extent. If you loaded the cart with heavy freight, you would have to push harder, but you would also develop greater strength. Suppose that the Godhead had permitted cosmic evolution to take its course up to and beyond the Jupiter stage. Humankind certainly could have developed well, but could become even stronger if obstacles were put in its path. For the good of humanity, therefore, certain mites had to receive adverse commands. They were not evil to begin with. One need not regard them as evil forces. Rather, one could say that they sacrificed themselves in order to place an obstacle in the path of development. These mites may therefore be called the gods of hindrance or gods of impediment in the broadest sense of the word. These are gods of obstructions or hindrances that have been placed along the path of development. And ever since that moment, the possibility was created for everything that was to be accomplished in the future. These countermanded, excuse me, these countermanded dunamis were not yet evil in themselves. On the contrary, by running up against the normal course of development, they were the great promoters of evolution. Nevertheless, they were the originators of evil, because out of the storms they produced, evil gradually arose. The course of development for the adversely commanded mites took a very different form from that of their fellows. The effect of their activity was very different, and as a result, during the development of the moon, these mites became the tempters of the beings we call angels. During the evolutionary stage of the moon, the angels were passing through their human phase. There were 
angel humans on the moon who witnessed the effect of these obstacles on the course of development. They said to themselves, We can now allow ourselves to assail these hindrances. We can plunge into the stream of the moon's development, but we prefer to abstain. We do not want to plunge in, but choose the, to remain above with the good gods. These angel beings, at a particular point during the course of the moon stage of development, tore themselves away from the mites, who down below had introduced obstacles into the development of the moon. But there were other angel humans on the moon who said, We will not follow our fellows, because if we did, the pattern of development would be turned around and nothing new would happen. Indeed, just because the hindrances were present, from the development of the moon stage on, something new was introduced. There were beings who said, We wish to have absolutely nothing to do with what is happening down there. We remain with the mites who do not wish to be touched by the lesser. These beings withdrew from the moon mass during the development of the old moon and became followers of everything that occurred in the sun. They wanted nothing to do with what happened on the moon, which had been cast aside because the hindrances were present. The others who plunged down, however, had to take into their bodily nature everything they had received of the existing developmental hindrances on the moon. They had to harden themselves more than otherwise would have been the case. Their bodily sheaths became denser than they would have been, and they bore the consequence of the actions of the mites in their bodies. We should remember, however, that the deeds of the mites or dominions, excuse me, the deeds of the mites or dunamis were well founded within the divine cosmic plan. A further consequence of all this was that when the development of the moon passed over into that of the earth, the whole process was in a certain way repeated. These beings who hurled themselves into the full tide of the moon development lagged behind those who would have nothing to do with it. Still others remained even further behind because they were attracted by the retrograde development. All of this, therefore, led to the presence of two sorts of angel humans during the development of the earth. Some of the angel humans were those who had gone ahead, and some were those who had stayed behind. The advanced angel humans now set to work on humanity in the Lemurian time, as humankind became mature enough to receive the seed of the human eye capital. They gave human beings the option, so to speak, of ascending immediately into spiritual worlds and having no more to do with what had mingled with the course of cosmic evolution since the moon phase of development. The beings who had stayed behind, whom we call luciferic beings, went to work on the human astral body. They could not reach the eye and injected the results of the war in heaven into the astral body. As the mites were countermanded into participation in the war in heaven and became gods of hindrance, the consequences of their actions crept into the human astral body, where they had a different and greater significance, for there they represent the possibility of error and the possibility of evil. Human beings were thus given the possibility of error and the possibility of evil, but at the same time they also received the capacity to rise above error and evil by their own strength. Consider that beings such as the mites or dunamis, belonging to the second hierarchy, did not have the possibility at all of becoming evil by themselves. They had to be adversely commanded. Only the beings of the third hierarchy, the angels who are closest to human beings, could follow or not follow the hindering mites. Those who did not succumb are represented in pictures depicting the victories fought out in the heavens. They are supposed to express what came to pass during the moon stage of development when human beings had advanced to the incarnation of the astral body, that is, to the human animal stage. The angel beings who remained pure, as it were, tore themselves away from the course of the moon development. They escaped what was taking place below on the moon. This picture is represented in many different forms before our souls. 
Originally, we find it depicted in the battle between Michael and the dragon. Footnote Revelations 12, see also Steiner, the archangel Michael, his mission and ours. End of footnote. We also find it expressed with great clarity in pictures of the Mithraic bull. But the object of such representations was not to say that these angel beings have forsaken their duty. They were intended to depict an ideal for the future. These beings, it was said, preferred to ascend into spiritual worlds. You, on the other hand, have descended along with other beings who followed the powers of hindrance. It is now up to you to work through what you have taken in and carry it upward into the spiritual world. On the upward path you are called on to become a Michael and a conqueror of the bull. A symbol such as this must be interpreted in this twofold way. So we see that humanity received the possibility of reaching its goal by its own powers, something that even the seraphim cannot attain through their own endeavors, only because the mites were given adverse orders. That is the most significant fact. The seraphim, cherubim, and thrones cannot do anything but follow the immediate impulses given them by the Godhead. The dominions, indeed the whole of the second hierarchy, must do likewise. Only among the ranks of the mites were some commanded adversely. They could also not do other than follow the orders of the Godhead when they threw themselves across the path of development. Even in causing what could be called the source of evil, they merely performed the will of the Godhead. By making themselves servants of evil, these mites accomplished the will of the Godhead, who wished to strengthen the good by means of the detour through evil. Let us now descend to the beings called powers, or exousiae. They, likewise, could not have become wicked by themselves, and the same applies to the spirits of personality, archai, and the fire spirits, the archangels. For when the latter passed through their human stage on the sun, the mites had not yet been adversely commanded, and there was not yet any possibility of becoming evil. The first to have this possibility of becoming evil were the angels, because this possibility existed only since the moon stage of development. The war in heaven took place during the transition from the sun to the moon. A number of angels rejected this possibility, refused to be seduced, so to speak, by the powers destined to introduce hindrances. They remained true to their former nature, so that we have, down to the angels, and also among some of the angels, beings of the higher hierarchies who cannot do anything but follow the divine will. This is most important. We come now to two categories of beings. First there are those angels who hurled themselves into what the mites had brought about during the war in heaven. These are beings who on account of their later deeds are called luciferic beings. They went to work on the human astral body during earthly evolution and introduced the possibility of evil, but also the possibility of developing oneself through one's own free activity. Thus in the whole range of the hierarchies, it is only among a portion of the angels and among human beings that we find the possibility of freedom. The possibility of freedom begins within the ranks of the angels, but it is fully developed only in humanity. When humanity came down to earth, human beings first had to fall prey to the mighty power of the Luciferic hosts. These hosts permeated the human astral body with their powers, so that the eye became enmeshed in this field of forces. During the Lemurian and Atlantean periods, and also subsequently, we find the eye wrapped in a cloud caused by Lucifer's influences. The human being was saved from being overpowered by these debilitating forces only because earlier beings, the angels who had remained above and the archangels, overshadowed the person and incarnated in the individuals chosen to guide humanity. This continued until the time when something remarkable happened. A being, who had previously always been united with the sun's existence, advanced so far that he could not only penetrate the human being's physical, etheric, and astral bodies 
as previously had been the situation with higher beings, but could also permeate the human being as far as the eye. You will recall that I described how higher beings descended during former times and ensouled human physical, etheric, and astral bodies. Now, at a special moment in time, an individual arose who had been chosen to receive the most exalted being into himself, a being who had been united with our sun existence and who now worked inspiringly into the eye, even down into all the forces of the eye. The eye expresses itself through the blood, just as the blood in its material substance is the expression of the eye, so the warmth of fire excuse me, so the warmth or fire of the blood, which is the remnant of the Saturn fire, is the expression of the eye in the elements. This being had to express itself physically in a twofold way. In the element of fire, the being proclaimed himself to Moses in the burning bush and in the lightning on Mount Sinai. One and the same being could penetrate the human eye and speak to Moses from the burning bush and from the lightning and thunder on Mount Sinai. This being prepared his advent and then appeared in a blood-permeated body, that of Jesus of Nazareth. This sun-being entered into an earthly individuality. Because the human eye will be filled and saturated more and more by the power that then penetrated it, this eye will become more and more capable of overcoming through its own forces all the influences that have the capacity to pull it down. For this being who penetrated the human eye is of a different nature from those other beings who formerly descended to earth and ensouled the physical, etheric, and astral bodies. Let us consider the ancient holy rishis. As we have seen, the spirit of a high being lived in their etheric bodies. Because the holy rishis had inherited the etheric body from great Atlantean ancestors in whom they ex that exalted being had lived, it was passed on to them. But the rishis could not comprehend, with their eye and astral bodies, what streamed through the inspiration of their etheric bodies. And so it went from epoch to epoch. Human beings received inspiration. They always experienced something like a force within them when they were inspired. Inspiration was something that they captured, as it were, with a force. The individual withdrew somewhat from the ordinary human capacity to manage on one's own. So that one could improve, could advance, the person had to be inspired by a more perfect being. This was the situation for all founders of religions. Beings who had been exalted above the war in heaven were infused into the religious founders, so human beings were not left to depend just on their own resources. In the Christ, however, a being of very different nature appeared. He was a being who did absolutely nothing, who exerted not the slightest compulsion to bring people to him, this is the main point. If you consider the propagation of Christianity, you will find living evidence that during his lifetime Christ did not do what occurred in spreading Christianity. Consider the founders of religions of ancient times. They are the great teachers of humanity. From a certain moment in their development, they begin to instruct and their teachings work on human beings with an overwhelming power. Now consider the Christ. Does the Christ actually work through his teachings? Anyone who thinks that Christ's main contribution lies in his teaching does not really understand the Christ. At least in the first instance, the Christ did not work through his teaching, but through what he did. And the greatest deed of the Christ was the deed that ended with his death. It was in fact his death. That is the most important point. Christ worked through a deed. And when knowledge of this action began to spread through the world, he was no longer physically present. That is the fundamental difference between the efficacy of Christ and that of other great founders of religions. This difference is hardly understood at all, but it is the most important one. 
all of the teachings of Christianity, everything that is preached in Christianity, every Christian teaching you can describe, you can find in other religious systems. This cannot be denied. It can certainly be said that the essence of Christian teaching is also contained in other systems. But has Christianity been effective through the contents of its teaching? Did the person who did the most in spreading Christianity rely on its teaching? Consider the Apostle Paul. Did he allow himself to be transformed from Saul to Paul by what is written in the Gospels? Paul persecuted the followers of Christ Jesus until the one who died on the cross appeared to him out of the clouds, that is, until Paul had his own personal occult experience of the fact that Christ lives. The effect of that death, the efficacy of that act, became the quickening impulse for Paul, and that is what matters. Other religious systems work through their teachings, and the teachings are the same as those found in Christianity. But in Christianity it is not a question of teachings. What matters is the deed that took place. The act of Christ only works on a person when one decides to allow it to have an effect, that is, when the deed is united with the absolutely free nature of the individual I. It is not enough for the Christ to be present in the human astral body. To be truly understood, Christ must be present in the I, and the I must freely resolve to receive the Christ. That is the point. But as a result of the I uniting itself with the Christ, this human I acquires within itself a reality, a divine power, not just a teaching. Therefore, it can be demonstrated a hundred times that the teachings of Christianity may already be found here or there, but that is not the point. The essential aspect of Christianity is the act that can only be made one's own through a voluntary ascent into higher worlds. Human beings receive the power of Christ into themselves because they willingly accept it, and no one can receive it who does not voluntarily accept it. This has become possible for the human being only since the Christ became human on earth, since he was called on to become a human being on the earth. The fallen angels, who came to live on earth as luciferic beings, are in a different position. Indeed, they should have become human on the moon. But they remained behind in the development. As a result, they can penetrate the astral body, but they cannot gain access to the I. They are in an unusual situation, which we can only represent graphically, even if that seems pedantic. Let's assume, leaving aside the etheric and physical bodies, that the astral body of the human being, during the Lemurian development, is represented by this circle. The I would then be encased within this astral body because it has gradually entered into the astral body. What happens next? During the Lemurian epoch, the Luciferic forces crept into the astral body from all sides and penetrated human beings with their activities. <clears throat> In human beings, these are expressed as lower passions. The possibility for human beings to succumb to error and evil is embedded in the astral body. The Luciferic spirits introduced that possibility into us. If they had not, we would never have had the possibility of erring, of doing evil. Instead, we would have been lifted up to a region where we would have received the eye untouched by hindering influences. This is the situation. But the great leaders of humanity protected human beings so that we should not sink too low. Then the Christ event occurred. Let us take a human being who has voluntarily received the Christ. Of course, Christianity is only at its beginning, but let us take an ideal situation. A human eye, in complete free will, has allowed the power of Christ to flow in. When the eye has advanced so far that it is permeated by the Christ, then the power of Christ irradiates the astral body and streams into the actions of the Luciferic powers that had been injected into it. And what will happen in the future? 
because with Christ's help and only with his help we can extinguish those qualities in us that stem from Lucifer, at the same time we can also gradually release the Luciferic powers. The time will come when the Luciferic powers, which had to sink to a lower stage of evolution for the sake of human freedom, and therefore could not experience the power of Christ on earth, will experience the power of Christ through human beings and so will be redeemed. Human beings will redeem Lucifer if they receive the Christ power in the appropriate way. As a result, human beings will grow stronger than they would have been otherwise. Imagine, if human beings had not received the Luciferic forces, the Christ power would have streamed forth but would not have encountered any Luciferic obstacles. It would have been impossible for us to progress in goodness, truth, and wisdom to the degree that we now can once we have to overcome these countervailing forces. The human being is one of the hierarchies, but distinct from the others. Human beings are different from seraphim, cherubim, and thrones, dominions, mites, powers, spirits of personality, fire spirits, and from some of the angels as well. Looking into the future, a human being can say, I am called to seek the impulse for my actions in the deepest recesses of my own inner being, not out of the contemplation of the Godhead as the seraphim do, for instance, but out of my own inner being. The Christ is a God who does not work in such a way that his impulses have to be followed. One follows the Christ only out of understanding and freedom. The Christ is the God who never seeks to hinder the free individual development of the I in this or that direction. The Christ could say in the profoundest sense, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the beings of the next hierarchy, who had the possibility of doing evil, the Luciferic beings, will again be redeemed and freed through the power of human beings. Thus we see that cosmic development does not simply repeat itself. New factors enter in. A human stage, such as that experienced by human beings, was not to be found previously among the angels, archangels, or primal beginnings. Humanity has a completely new mission to fulfill in the world, the mission we have just characterized. Humanity descended into the earthly world in order to accomplish this mission, Christ came into the world as the free helper of humanity, not as a God working from above, but as the firstborn among many. Only in this way can we grasp the full dignity and importance of humankind among the members of the hierarchies. Looking up to the exalted nature and glory of the higher hierarchies, we can say to ourselves, however mighty, wise, and good these higher hierarchies may be, and hence unable to err from the true path, it is humanity's great mission to bring freedom into the world, and along with freedom what we call in the truest sense of the word love. For without freedom, love is impossible. Beings who absolutely must obey a particular impulse merely do so. But for those who can do otherwise, there is only one power that enables them to, to do so, and that is love. Freedom and love are two poles that belong together. If love is to enter our cosmos, it can do so only through freedom. That is, through Lucifer and the one who conquers Lucifer, the one who is also the redeemer of human beings, the Christ. That is why the earth is the cosmos of love and freedom. And it is important that without wishing to tempt human beings away from humility, we should learn to familiarize ourselves with the sequence of the hierarchies as this has always been known in the esotericism of the West. Seraphim, cherubim, and thrones obey the direct impulses transmitted under the gaze of the Godhead. The dominions, mites, and powers are still so closely bound up with the higher powers that they have to receive countermands so that the development of humanity can move forward. Even the archangels and the spirits of personality cannot err. They cannot sink into evil of their own free resolve. 
The hierarchies immediately above humanity were called messengers and arch-messengers to indicate that they were not accomplishing their own tasks but merely fulfilling orders received from above. But humanity is a hierarchy that is gradually maturing so that it will carry out its own tasks. Throughout the development of Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan, human beings will mature gradually toward the accomplishment of their own impulses. Even if this goal is still distant today, in time humanity will attain it. What are the hierarchies? We begin with the seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. They exercise their authority by carrying out the impulse received from the gods. Then come the mites who owe their strength to what is received from above, and the same is true of the powers. Were they to become evil, they could do so only as a result of a decision of the divine world. And now we come to the spirits of personality and the arch-messengers and messengers who descend to the immediate proximity of humanity. How should humanity be integrated into the ranks of the hierarchies? After the archangels and angels, arch-messengers and messengers, we must place among the hierarchical ranks those we may call the spirits of freedom or the spirits of love. Counting from above downward, this is the tenth hierarchy. This tenth hierarchy, although still in the process of development, nevertheless belongs to the spiritual hierarchies. It is not just a matter of repetition in the universe. Each time a cycle has been completed, a new element is introduced into cosmic evolution, and the integration of the new element is always the task of the hierarchy that is at its human stage of development. In these lectures we have endeavored to fathom the meaning and significance of humanity by considering the significance of our cosmos. Today, to some extent at least, we have raised the spiritual question of the significance of the human being, and we have tried to establish the significance of the human being, the point at the center of the universe, according to the teachings of the mysteries. In so doing, we tried to solve the riddle of the center, the human being, from the periphery, the riddle of the point from the perspective of the circumference. In doing so, we place our knowledge within the sphere of reality. This is the essential point, that true spiritual scientific knowledge is also real concrete knowledge. In other words, spiritual scientific knowledge itself directly produces a picture of the cosmos and the spiritual hierarchies. We are at the center of our universe. Everything around us loses its significance because we have to acknowledge that the outer sense-perceptible world cannot solve the riddles that confront us. It is as if everything were concentrated at a single point. But just as everything compresses together, the solution of the cosmic riddle comes back from the periphery, as powerfully real as matter itself, which is a reflection and image of the spiritual. Matter gathers itself together, disappears at the center, and reappears at the periphery. That is reality. Our knowledge is real when it steps in front of our eyes as the structure and process of the entire cosmos. Such knowledge is no longer a form of speculation, a weaving of fanciful theory, for such knowledge is born out of the cosmos. This is the feeling we should develop. Wisdom must become an ideal for us, born out of the periphery of the cosmos and capable of filling us with great strength with the strength that enables us to fulfill our own destiny and to achieve our own cosmic ideal. With this strength we shall also be able to realize the human ideal that awaits us in the future.